So the first question of this M2 paper is, as is often the case, an impulse and momentum question, and uh, they're normally pretty straightforward. The impulse equation, which hopefully we all know, is impulse is change in momentum, and it works. Uh, we're, we're in 2D here, so we put our I's and J's in. In some ways, easier than some of the M1 questions on this, because we don't have to worry about you know, the signs are given to us and all the rest of it, so. Um, anyway, the first question says um, that it's initially moving with this velocity, and this is the mass, and we're given, the fact that it's given an impulse of this. So 4i plus 5j is equal to the mass, which is 0.5, v minus u, now u is 2i, minus 3j. Um, now we can just tidy this up a bit, double both sides or divide by 0 0.5 will give us 8i plus 10j equals to v, and now gets get rid of this bracket here, minus 2i, we've got a double negative here, that's plus 3j. So we've got the final velocity is equal to 10i uh, plus 7j. So we needed that final velocity because it wants a gain in kinetic energy. So the gain in kinetic energy, well, the, the will be basically half mv squared minus, or magnitude of v squared, minus half mu squared. Will be the gain in Ke. Okay, so let's just take that out. Um, a half times by 0 0.5. Let's put it all in one bracket because you've got a common factor of half m here. V squared. Now there's no point in just finding the magnitude of this just to square it out again. So we just want the components of this square uh, added and squared, squared and added, should I say? That's the final velocity. Take away the components of our initial velocity, squared and added. So that equals to a quarter times, now this is 100 plus 7, which is 149. Take away 9, 140. Take away 4, 136. So that equals to 34 joules. Okay, not bad first question. Let's look at question two. Now question two is a variable acceleration question, variable velocity and all the rest of it. Um, acceleration, we're asked to find when t equals to half. Well, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. But v, if I multiply this out, uh, being careful, I'm gonna, the component, the squared component is minus two t squared. The, the bit in t is going to be plus t from those two, plus 2t from that, so it's plus 3t. And the constant number is going to be minus 1. So that's dv by dt is equal to minus 4t plus 3. So when t equals to half... Acceleration is equal to minus four times a half plus three. So the acceleration equals one. Okay. Part B, um, notice the key word here is distance, which is something they'll often do here. You test whether you really do understand the distinction between distance and displacement. Because if you just put, if you integrate this, because of course velocity, is the displacement differentiated so we need to integrate this to work out displacement but the thing is we want a distance and uh, the key thing to think about here is that the velocity equals zero when t equals one so it changes direction and that's the key to look out for when 
working, trying to work out a distance between an, in a, within a time to, uh, interval, the key thing to think about is, has there been a change in direction? Which it has. So, what I'm going to do is work out the, the displacement when t equals to 1, or, or the distance it's travelled, which will be the same thing, between a half and naught because there's no ch change in direction between a half and naught the velocity is actually negative for the whole of that through between half and naught the velocity is negative because this comes out as negative no, sorry this comes out as negative this bit so if we integrate this between that interval we'll get how far it's traveled in the direction it's gone within that time interval. So that will be equal to the integral half to naught of minus 2t squared plus 3t minus 1 dt. Uh, integrating that, I get minus 2 thirds t cubed, adding 1 to power, divided by that. Adding 1 to the power there is 3 t squared divide by that number and minus t that integrated between half and naught so if i work that out and some input the number that's minus two thirds a half cubed plus three over two a half squared minus a half that's the number half Input it, and of course, when we put zero into all of these, I'm going to get zero. I'll write it in just for completeness. That, when we work all that out, we're going to get the number minus five over 24. Right, so what's happened is within the interval one to a half, it's actually gone backwards. Sorry, zero to a half, it's actually gone backwards. So if we say it's zero here with t equals zero, when t equals to half, it's gone to the left, if you like, or wherever we call it in the negative direction is. So it's t equals to half. S, meaning displacement, is minus 5 over 24. And clearly, the distance it's moved is 5 over 24 and it's moved in that direction and as I've said before we've got a change of direction now because what's going to happen is the velocity is going to become positive after a half and it's going to start moving in this direction but we need to know what the you know how much further within the interval from naught to from one to half so if we do the same integration but this time from a one to a half of minus 2t squared plus 3t minus 1 that equals to we've already integrated it so let's check it's right so we don't have to go back and correct minus 2 thirds t cubed plus 3t squared over 2 minus t Okay, so that equals to, let's put in the limits, minus two thirds times one cubed plus three over two times one squared minus one. Take away, <coughs> now I could put them all in again, but handily, I've already put in the value of half in before I've got it here, which is minus five over 24, so I'll save myself a bit of time by putting minus 5 over 24 in there. So that should make life a little bit quicker. Minus 2 thirds plus 3 over 2 minus 1 plus 5 over 24. And that all comes to, I think, 1 over 24. So going back to the original situation, 
we've had the thing going minus 5 over 24 or the distance wise is 5 over 24 in that direction and then it's gone 1 over 24 distance wise in that direction so now we have the you have to combine these two its displacement from its original position in the first half a second is 5 over 24 it happens to be going in a negative direction and its displacement from its original position in the interval from half to 1 is 1 over 24 but it's going in, in the other direction so there's been a change of direction it's basically gone there and back again 5 over 24 one way reverse and gone 1 over 24 the other so the total distance is these two added together which is 5 over 24 plus 1 over 24 which is 6 over 24 which is 0 0.25 meters okay so now we have question 3 is a centers of mass question these can be quite fiddly but uh, this isn't the hardest of these questions we've seen um, the we've just got rectangle we can split this into three different shapes, let's split it this way okay and we can split it into that and therefore work out the centre of mass I tend to like to work out the ratio of masses and kind of cancel that down before I put it into equation but I know a lot of people put it straight into the equation which is fine um, but if we look at the masses because we're told it's uniform mass is proportional to the area so we've got this rectangle here the rectangle described there that has got area 12a squared this rectangle here has also has got area well actually it's not it's for this distance here is 4a from here to here so that's also got area 12a squared and then we've got this triangle here okay well that has got it's a triangle of course this distance is 4a and this distance is 3a so it's those two multiply together and then half so it's 6a squared which means the total is 30a squared now if we cancel those down we can see that we can divide by, through by 6a squared so we can see that each the, the actual ratio is 2 2 1 and 5 simplified down okay so those are the ratio of the masses let's look at the x and y uh, coordinates for the center of mass now it's uniform so the center of mass of this one of this 12a squared mass here will be across well we've got a distance of 2a from d to c so that's a and upwards we've got a distance of 6a so that's 3a and then for this rectangle the a bit well we've got the, it's going to be halfway at this length here is 4a so it's 2a from here but we need to add on the 2a originally so that's 4a okay and the upwards bit is 3a over 2 because the length here is 3a so it's halfway up from that okay so that's 3a over 2 Right now let's look at the triangle. I'm a little bit more fiddly, but it shouldn't be too bad. But, um, looking at the horizontal, the x coordinate, this length from here to here is going to be a third of the length along there, so it's 4a over 3 horizontally plus 2a. So 2a plus 4a over 3, that equals 2. 10a over 3 
okay so that's the horizontal the vertical again looking upwards we've got the length from here to here is 3a so it's a third up from there which is a plus the 3a we already uh, from here to here so that's 4a okay it's looking a bit like that, isn't it? Didn't read them there. okay so we've got that we've set up our diagram and then we can use the equations to work out x bar and y bar right so we want the x bar the distance oa and od which is going to be our x bar and y bar as we set it up so we can use the formula i'll write it down mi xi is equal to x bar sigma mi but basically that means that we've got this time this plus this times this plus this times this equals this times this so 2 times a plus 2 times 4a plus 1 times 10a over 3 equals to 5x bar so adding all of these together we get 40a over 3 is equal to 5x bar x bar so that gives me x bar dividing 5 on both sides is equal to 8 a over 3 and as I just said that is the distance from OC so that's the answer for part 1 from OD sorry ok so that's our X bar and then for the Y bar for part 2 we can just do the same it's this times this plus this times this plus this times this so that's 2 times 3a plus 2 times 3a over 2 plus 1 times 4a equals to 5y bar so I get 5y bar equals to 13a so y bar equals to 13a over 5 okay um, and that's the distance from OA of course just a little exam tip before we move on to the next part you may think, oh, why, you know, why am I writing one times this, and why am I making it so bracketed things unnecessarily? It may, there may be a point to that, but I just happen to know, being a former examiner for M2, that the the way method marks are allocated are that they're dimensionally consistent. So we we've got we need a mass times a distance, a mass times a distance, a mass times a distance. And if there's a mistake, obviously if you get it right, you'll probably exercise some benefit of the day. But if you get a question wrong, you might say, if, for example, we add a, we add this number as a three, and a, therefore a number seven there for some strange reason. Because we've seen that the person's actually multiplied a what they think is a, di a correct distance to a um, to a correct mass we're going to get some method marks so it's just good practice really and it's also makes things fairly clear okay the um the next part part b probably the most common type of um, like second part is to work at an angle when it's suspended from a point well let's just look at this let's redraw this diagram here and what it what it wants is the angle that this makes the shapes makes when it's suspended from c but it wants this angle here so let's redraw the diagram and do a little, make it show a little bit more detail so the lumen has been suspended from c 
So let's draw in a vertical line. It's normally not a good idea to try and or in, draw the actual thing with the vertical line actually vertical. So let's draw in our vertical line. So the angle that's being asked for here is this angle here. Let's call it angle beta. Well, one thing we know is that this angle will go through the centre of mass. And the centre of mass we know is eto a over 3 from here. We know that this distance is 8a over 3. But we know the distance from here to here is 2a. So we know therefore that the distance of the distance from here to here is 2a, a over 3 minus 2a, which is equal to, that's the distance here, must be equal to 8a over 3 minus 2a, so that's 2a over 3. Let's rub up the case there. Let's rub the line down. So that's 2a over 3. So that's 8a over 3 minus 2a, where the centre of mass is, take away the 2a from there. And then this distance here, that there is going to be equal to 6a, we can just put that bit then from there, take away the centre of mass, the y distance, which is 13a over 5. Is that distance there. Now that equals to 30a minus 13a, so it's 17a over 5. Okay, let's call this angle alpha. Okay, so we can say that tan alpha opposite over adjacent is equal to 2a over 3 divided by 17a over 5. Okay, so that's equal to, flipping it over, 10 over 51. So that's the angle alpha here. So now we want the angle beta, that's the required angle we're being, we're being asked for. Well, we have also got a right angle triangle here. Okay, and that right angle triangle, let's rub these distances off now just to. Make it clear that this right angle triangle here, that length there is 4a, and this length here is equal to. Two a uh, six a take away three a that's three a. So this whole angle here is easy to work out, easy to work out, because it's equal to tan minus one four over three. So the required angle beta is equal to that whole angle there, which is tan minus one inverse tan or arc tan of four over three. Take away. the angle alpha that we have here, which is 10 minus 1, 10 over 51. And to the nearest angle, that's equal to 42 degrees. So question 4 is a collisions question, a few bits to it. So let's take part A first, and then look at the other bits later. So here we have a fairly familiar scenario where we've got two particles going towards each other. Particle P, we've got mass 2m. And it's moving in a straight line with, sp with speed u. And particle q has got mass m. And that's moving in a straight line in the opposite direction with speed 3u. Do take some time to make sure you get the information correct. Um, now, let's have our 
different uh, after the collision there will probably change direction VP will certainly direct some, uh, change direction so P will certainly change direction Q probably will as well but P will definitely will because the moment there's no way they could both be going in this direction because the overall momentum is in this direction but anyway we're going to go on to that in part B of the question so we'll set it up like that VP definitely will be positive as we'll see later VQ well probably will change direction so let's set up our diagram like that and then use the momentum equation conservation of lin linear momentum that gives us 2m times u minus m times 3u is equal to 2m times by the velocity of p after the collision negative because it's going in the other direction plus m times vq ok we can't be certain that's going in that direction if we call it positive I'm happy for not being wrong that will come out as negative so we can then look at the uh, we can then cancel off the m and cancel that you get minus u is equal to minus 2vp plus vq so that's one equation we set up. Now let's set up a Newton's law of restitution or Newton's experimental law equation. Um, that's speed of separation over speed of approach. Well, assuming that they are going away like this, then we'll be adding these two together for the speed of separation. So E speed of separation will be VP plus VQ all divided by these two added together because they're going towards each other so that's 4u so that comes to 4eu is equal to vp plus vq right now if i were to subtract these two equations let's just move this down okay let's number them just to make it clear what i'm doing if we number this one one and this one two we can make it clear so what I'm going to do is first of all do 2 take away 1 to get an equation so that will give us we'll have 4eu plus u because there's a double negative there is equal to vq will cancel and we'll have vp take away 2vp so that's 3vp so that gives us vp equals to Let's factorise it out a bit. U3 over 4E plus 1. So that's our answer to part 1 of question A. Part 2 is to find the velocity of Q. So we need to eliminate P. Well, I've got a minus 2VP there and I've got a plus 2VP here. So I can get the eliminate this by doubling this equation and add into this one so doing that I'm going to get 8eu here take away u and I'm going to have of course the vq the vp will cancel that's why I doubled it so it's 2vp take away 2vp which is equal to naught plus 2vq plus 2vq so that's 3vq vq 2vq plus vq so that's 3vq so that gives us vq is equal to u over 3 8e minus 1 we begin to see why they say a e is greater than 1 8 because in fact if e is greater than 1 8 q won't reverse either but going on to part b it talks about for all possible values of e that vp is reversed so we're actually looking at this expression here the vp expression 
that we have and we set notice we set it up in our di diagram assuming it does reverse so we just need to show that this is positive now all we need to really say is vp is equal to u over 3 for e plus 1 is greater than 0 since now we need to justify why it's greater than 0 e is greater than 0 of course that's the key thing they want uh, not required but and u is greater than 0 of course because u is speed so therefore so therefore that's true so therefore vp reversed okay so then there's another part to this question yet okay part c has the particle q rebounding off a wall and of course vp as we've already found is going off in this direction we've got q rebounding off a wall and we're told f is the Curve person to restitute them between the particle and the wall, the particle Q and the wall. Well, we're also given the value of E equals three quarters. Now we've worked out expressions for VP and VQ in terms of E. Now we know E, we'll be doing ourselves a big favour to work it out straight away. So VP is equal to U over three times four times three quarters plus one. 4 times 3 quarters is equal to 3 ok plus 1 so that's equal to 4 so VP is equal to 4U over 3 and similarly VQ we've got an expression for that as well it's 80 minus 1 is U over 3 times 8 times 3 quarters minus 1 8 times 3 quarters is equal to 6 take away 1 which is 5 so it's 5u over 3 so work them out straight away do not work with expressions with e and f in when we're given e and that would be senseless unfortunately some kind of thing students do um, so we then are given the fact that this so we know that this came it hits a wall with speed 5u over 3, three and we know that the coefficient to restitution is f between q and the wall so it must rebound with 5u over 3f and we this one's still going along at 4u over 3 and we're told that there is a second collision so there's a second collision if 5u over 3f is greater than 4u over 3. Obviously the u cancels and the 3 cancels. So we're left with f is greater than 4 over 5. Right, but don't forget also the e co or the coefficient of restitution for a perfectly elastic collision has got to be less than 1. So we need to say also that it's less than one because it needs to be F. The coefficient of restitution is always less than or equal to one. So there's our answer. Question five is a statics question. Um, it's got a hinge and and it's also got a cylinder. Um, not it looks probably maybe a bit more threatening than it is when you first look at it. The main thing here is to acknowledge that the reaction force they're asking for is perpendicular to the contact because that's a circular and the tangent is basically perpendicular to the tangent there. And once we've got that, with a little bit of care, this shouldn't be too bad. Let's do a bigger diagram because uh, di good diagrams are key to certainly statics questions and probably mechanics questions in general. So let's mark on the forces, as I say, we've got the reaction force which is perpendicular to the point of contact there. Um, we've got a weight which is, we're told it's uniform, 
up there, so the weight is going to be halfway along there, so it's going to be 8B from point A. The distance from here to here is 8B, which we can use in equations in a moment. And then I'm not going to need this for the first part, but it's asking for the second part, the angle that the reaction is there. So at the hinge, it's normally good to split the force at the hinge into a vertical and horizontal horizontal component like that. So let's say not too bad this, especially uh, to start with, because we can take moments about eight. We probably do need to work a bit on angles. Um, let's call this angle theta here. And note here, we can say that this distance here is five, that distance there is 5b. Let's work on the angles before we do anything. We can say, because this would be the hypotenuse of the this triangle here, so hypotenuse of that triangle. So we have sine theta opposite over adjacent is equal to 5b over 13b. So we have a 513 triangle, 51213 triangle. With theta there. So we can say that cos theta equals to 12 over 13 when we put into, we need that in our calculations. So note also that this length here, for the same reason, Pythagoras' theorem that we've just worked out is 12b. Or you can say it's 13b sine uh, cos theta which is equal to 12b, so that's that distance from there to there. So we can now take moments about a. So we have r, because it's already perpendicular, doesn't need to be resolved. r times by the distance, which is 12b, perpendicular distance, is equal to the weight. Now the weight, if we resolve that into the part here, we'll note that this angle here is theta, so this component here will be W next to this angle here, cos theta, so that's W cos theta, sorry about the menu that keeps appearing, can't seem to stop it at the moment, cos theta, times by the distance, as I've already pointed out, because it's a uniform rod, 8b. Now b cancels, and we can write in cos, sub in cos theta, so we have 12r is equal to w times by cos theta, which is 12 over 13, times by 8. So the 12 cancels and we're left with r equals to 8 over 13 w. Four marks for that, it's not too bad is it? Right, so now we can go on to the second bit and it wants the, the resultant force acting is it wants the angle that this is inclined at. We need to find the vertical and horizontal components and then just do a bit of trick to work out the angle. So generally speaking, it's not a good idea to do moments more than once. Sometimes it is, but the resolving equations are normally easier to use. So we can easily get two resolving equations here, particularly in this case, because we've got y and x that we're looking for. So resolving horizontally, we have x equals, now we need this angle here, mark this angle here, that angle's theta there, if you're wondering why, because if you move this across, we can see that this angle's theta here, just playing with the angles a bit, because that angle theta will be the same as this angle theta, which will be because of opposite angles theta there. It's easy to see. 
do a bit of playing around at the angles theta there. So we have the x, which is the horizontal component, equals to the horizontal, which is the horizontal component of that force, is equal to r times by sine theta, because it's away from the marked angle there. So it's r sine theta. But we know that sine theta is 5 over 13. So we can say, and we know that r is equal to 8 over 13. So we have 8 over 13 w times by 5 over 13. So I've written 18, but I meant 8, of course. 8 over 13 w times by 5 over 13. So that's 40 over 13 w. And we can resolve vertically as well. Um, resolving vertically upwards, we've got r cos theta, the component of this, because of the theta here next to it, we want the bit straight up, so that's r cos theta, plus y, because that's also upwards, is equal to the downwards force, which is w. So that gives us y equals to w minus r cos theta which gives us y equals to w minus r, which is 8 over 13 w cos theta, which is equal to 12 over 13. Now that comes to, this 8 times 12 is equal to 96, so 13 times 13 is 169, so this should be 169 on top here of course. We saw that, so it's 169W. So 13 times 13 is equal to 169. So that's 169 minus 96, which is equal to 73W over 169. Okay, so 73W over 169. So now we can work out the angle. So we've got looking in detail of too much going on there. So let's write it again. Y x. We've got this bit y, this bit x, and we want the horizontal bit. We're being asked for this angle alpha here. So we can say that tangent alpha is equal to x over y opposite over adjacent which is equal to 40w over 169 divided by 73w over 169 so that gives us tangent alpha is equal to 40 over 73 as required. Question 6 is a relatively standard work energy and power question. Um, the, we've got a car pulling a trailer up a slope. And we're told the angle of that slope sine alpha equals a quarter uh, 1 over 14 and it's connected by a tow bar cars pulling of course there will be a driving force pulling this up otherwise it would never get up of course there's a driving force we're told the resistance is as well um, 600 newtons for the car and 200 newtons for the trailer okay and we're to also told the acceleration 0 0.5 and we're also told the, the particular speed it's doing at an instant 10 meters per second and 0.5 meters per second squared for the acceleration so in this case all we really need to do is apply f equals ma 
and then P equals FE and we find the driving force. If we find the driving force we can find the power. Okay so um, now we can do this to the whole system. We can always apply F equals MA to a whole system and it's often a good idea but only if it's moving in one direction. It's got to be moving in a line and so it can't, can't work with pulley questions in general. But connected particles like this, you can apply F equals MA to the whole system. And the advantage is we take out the tension in the tow bar from our equation. And particularly advantageous here because then not being asked for the tension in the tow bar. So anyway, let's look at the forces upwards. We've got F is obviously the driving force. We've got, I haven't marked them on yet, we've obviously got the two weights going down or the components of the two weights going down. And because the angle is alpha here, the components will be sine alpha of the respective weights. So we've got the weight of this one is 800 G. So the bit parallel to the slope is 800 G sine alpha. And also the 300 G sine alpha for the trailer equals and then we've got the two resistances oh no, no, no we've got to take off the two resistances of course that's minus 200 minus 600 is equal to the so it's uh, was it 200 oh, yeah 200 uh, is equal to the total mass which is 1100 times by the acceleration which is given as 0 0.5 okay um, so let's just do some calculations here uh, F take away bringing these two together 1100 times 9.8 times sine alpha which is 1 over 14 take away 800 is equal to 550 so when I work that out that gives me F is equal to 2120 newtons working out F doing a calculation from that gives me F is equal to 2102 newtons then I can use P is equal to F A So P is equal to 2120 times by the speed, and we're given the speed as 10. So remember when we use P equals FV, we're talking about driving force. Occasionally we, I see students make mistakes with this. Driving force here, whereas with F equals MA, that means resultant overall force. What are the total forces? And students sometimes make mistakes with that. So we, we know the driving force is 2120 newtons. So that gives me 21200 watts. Now, the units are said, it is says that P kilowatts is the value of P. So we better convert our units to kilowatts. So that's P is equal to 20, divide that by a thousand, 21.2 kilowatts, so that we well, make sure we don't get penalized on incorrect units or scales of units. Okay, so that's uh, the part A. Part B, uh, this is a work energy uh, principle thing that we're going to be using. So if we scroll up to part B. It says when the car is moving up a road at 12 meters per second, the tow bar breaks. And now it starts talking about the trailer moving up. Because what's going to happen? So forget about the car now. We're talking about the trailer. It's not being pulled up anymore. It goes a distance D up the slope. Before coming to rest. Obviously the velocity here is equal to zero. Whereas the velocity here is equal to 12 meters per second. Where it's going zero meters per second here. So it loses kinetic energy. Um, we are still told that the resistances are 200 newtons. During this time. 
Right, now we're going to use the work energy principle here. Um, we'll call this angle theta as we say, that angle is theta. So this distance with the vertical distance is going to be d sine theta. We're going to need that for working out the potential energy. And d sine theta therefore is d over 14. Because sine theta is 1 over 14. So I'd say if you've seen any of the, these things before, I tend to like to summarize, especially when there's lots going on here, uh, the work energy principle in this formula. But when using this formula, we really do need to be careful to make sure gains are gains and losses are losses. So the work done here will be taken away here because of the negative 200. The 200 force is going to take away mechanical energy from the system. Kinetic energy is going to be increased. And potential energy, sorry, kinetic energy, oh, totally the opposite. Kinetic energy is going to be decreased and potential energy is going to be increased because it goes up the slope. Okay. And work done will be take, because it's a resistive force, that will be negative because it's taken away mechanical energy. So it's lost kinetic energy. So that's negative. Uh, the, it's lost all its kinetic energy basically, so negative, and we were told the mass of this thing somewhere. I think it was 300, but let's just check. Yeah, 300. So negative half times 300 times by 12 squared. That's a decrease uh, in potential energy plus. Now it's increase, sorry, decrease in kinetic energy. So I'm getting my words mixed up here. So it's decreased kinetic energy. The potential energy is increased by the mass times by g 9.8 times by the vertical distance it's moved up, which is d over 14. Okay. And the work done is force times distance. FD is work done, force times distance it's moved along. But we've got to, here we, if we're going to use this approach, we've got to realize it's going to be a negative because it's taken away energy. If for some reason we were talking about a driving force, then we would put a positive in. Uh, for this, or and if there were both of them, we'd put positive for the driving force and negative for the resi resistive forces. But anyway, we've only got the the resistive force, so that will be take away two hundred d. Okay, so let's work out uh, some of these things now. Um, and we're just going to rearrange this. We've got. The, this bit here and this bit, 300 times 9.8 divided by 14 is 210d. Bringing the minus 200 to the other side, that's 200d, equals 2. And this whole thing here works out to 21600. So that gives me 410d is equal to 21600 so that gives me d is equal to those two divided by each other so d equals to 52.7 to 3 significant figures you can also write 53 meters because of the use of g but don't get any more than three significant figures okay so that's Question six. Now let's do the final question seven. Right, so this is the last question on the paper, and in my opinion, by far the hardest question, particularly towards the end. Um, it's easy to kind of plow into a question as well. And a few people, when they were doing this in class, what they were, they were kind of using this diagram to try and do this, which is easily done. But part A really has nothing to do with uh, 
the diagram which is uh, here which is actually related to later parts in the question so let's take that bit out of the way for the moment we're going to look at that later this is actually what we used to call standard book work um, and it's like a standard thing that you could be asked from time to time general a general equation to derive um, okay so this relates to the equation what's called the equation of a path say x y obviously it's a parabola and what we have is the vertical and horizontal component we're told it's originally u the vertical component because the angle is alpha if we draw it up here because the angle of alpha there the vertical component is u sine alpha and the horizontal is u cos alpha so we've got u cos alpha here v sine alpha here and what we're going to do is we're going to consider horizontal motion now horizontally the speed is constant so we have y y x say which is the horizontal distance traveled in time t is equal to u cos alpha t vertically we're going to use s equals ut plus half a t squared now u is equal to v sine alpha t is equal to whatever the time is and a is equal to minus g we have s which is y equals to u but in this case it's u sine alpha so i wrote v there but obviously I meant u u sine alpha t minus a half g t squared now we can see from the above formula formula above it that rearranging for t gives me t is x over u cos alpha so we can rearrange so we can substitute for t okay so we're substituting for t we have y is equal to u sine alpha t which is x over u cos alpha minus a half g times t squared which is x over u cos alpha squared so we can see the u cancel in here and that gives me y equals to sine alpha over cos alpha which is tan alpha x so we've sorted the first part out minus a half g let's write it over one fraction actually so we've got so that's one g so it's g x squared over 2u squared cos squared alpha now we can then write that as tan alpha x minus g x squared over 2u squared sec squared alpha we might as well use the fact that we are we do actually have knowledge of trig identities here um, um, so we can just then use put in the one plus tan identity that we've all know about and that's it okay let's it again over one thing like that Put it over there just to make it consistent with the way it's written in the question. 
Okay, that's required. So that's standard bookwork. Uh, so in part B, now we're into the diagram it's given us. Basically something being thrown horizontally um, and landing vertically below. And it wants the speed of the stone as it hits the ground in terms of U, G and T. Well, let, let's look at the components. We can use energy, but I decided against it. Doesn't matter really. Horizontal speed is constant and that equals to u because that's how it works here when it's always going to have a horizontal speed u all the way along here i have a horizontal speed u but we need to work out the vertical speed it has now the vertical speed so we're going to u we're going to apply v equals u plus a t downwards so we have, let's call it VY, as we go up to all this diagram so that we can, basically we want to work at VY and so we can work out the overall speed, we call that V, this is VY, this is VX but it's equal to U and we, so we can use Pythagoras to work out V. So let's look at VY. now. Vertically, there is no, it starts off with speed zero vertically here. So we have zero. And if we take it down, which is positive, we can say plus G big T, because we're told big T is the time it takes to get go from C to B. So VY is equal to G T. So, um, so the overall speed is V and it's these two, the square root of these two added. So that's U squared plus VY squared, which is equal to the square root of U squared plus G T squared. And then get rid of the bracket there. V is equal to square root of U squared plus G squared T squared. Okay, so that's part B. And then finally to part C. Now, in my opinion, this is by far the hardest uh, part of the paper. I felt working through that there wasn't anything too nasty on this paper until we got to here. This looks a bit unusual, almost has a step like up to it. Um, it says um, it is found that using the same initial speed u. The target can also be hit by projecting the angle at some angle alpha. So like that. So it can still hit, but it's still got the same initial speed u. It won't be the same horizontal speed, but it will have the same speed overall and it can hit the target here. And then we need to prove this relationship. So it's a little bit abstract and a little bit unusual for, for M2, uh, I would say. Took us a little while to work this one out in class. Um, let me just, it does give us a bit of a hint. It tells um, using the result in part A. So I'm just going to pull down the result from part A and then proceed from there. So there it is. So we may, we it's given us a hint to use this, so we better use it. Um, it says using this. So what? Are, how are we going to use this to start off with? Well, at this point, the x coordinate from the coordinate of this, if we call this point zero zero, this uh, point here is then equal to d minus h because it's gone h downwards. So we're just putting d and minus h in here. So we can say minus h is equal to tan alpha x minus g. Well, not x, it's, it's d now, isn't it? So let's put the d in front. Minus g, d squared, 1 plus tan squared alpha over 2u squared. Right, now notice the formula doesn't have a u squared in it. Uh, so we need to replace u squared some, and uh, u squared somehow with t squared or u with t. 
So what can we do to do this? Well, and also it doesn't have a H in either. So we need to substitute some stuff in here. And this is where the tricky part comes in, at least I suppose, now that you get two marks for doing that. Um, right, now it's important to see that T is the time that it would take in this situation, not the time that it takes for the one which is going off at an angle. So one important uh, piece of information horizontally, which we've already seen, I think, um, or not quite, but we've seen that the horizontal distance, because that refers, big T is the time it takes when it's hurled off horizontally, is D is equal to UT. Not, as someone wrote, uh, not U cos alpha t because that would be the time it takes when it's been projected at an angle and big t refers to the time it takes when it's not projected at an angle and it's kind of key which confused some of us um, so horizontal vertically the distance well we can apply s equals ut plus half a t squared to get a formula for h because then again we've got u is naught because vertically it's uh, naught um, and again we're referring to the original situation not the change one um, the original situation where it's actually being pulled off horizontally so t is equal to big T so then we have um, and we've got s is equal to H if we're taking down which is positive and A is G so we have H is equal to naught times T plus a half G big T squared so we get H is equal to half G big T squared so now it's just a case of subbing in for what we need here um, let's well, one thing I notice here is we've got d squared over u squared and we can substitute that out for t squared we've kind of got half an uh, eye on what's happening here so instead of getting a stack fraction in here I'm going to do this minus h is equal to d well that's equal to u t tan alpha uh, we don't want to substitute for t sorry about that d tan alpha don't need to do that but we do want to substitute for h, so we've got minus half g capital T squared. And just to make it look a bit tidier, what I'm going to do is g over 2, d over u squared 1 plus tangent squared alpha. And d over u squared is equal to t squared. So you, we can replace this with minus half g t squared d tan alpha minus g over 2 t squared because as I say d over u equals t squared from this 1 plus tangent squared alpha then multiplying out we have d tan alpha minus half g t squared minus half g t squared tangent squared alpha okay it's looking promising because these two terms are going to cancel and we get d tan alpha is equal to half g t squared tangent squared alpha so we can divide out one of the tan alphas which finally gives us d is equal to half g t squared tan alpha okay so it gives us the alternative um, angle it could be 
given from if we knew what D and big T were, how they relate to each other. Okay, incidentally, if we look at this equation here, very quite interesting really, we've got two cases where it would hit here. And one of the reason that if we actually looked at this original equation here, we've done a question, but sometimes it's, you kind of think, well, what's going on here? If we were to, instead of to canceling out the tan alpha, we were to factorize, we'd get tan alpha out as a factor, and then we would have d minus half g t squared tan alpha. And this gives us the two solutions where it starts off with speed u, it would start off from c and finish off at b. Well, one of them obviously applies to alpha equals north, which is the one which we're given in the first place, and the other one is for the, the one where it's produced at an angle alpha. So that's why cancelling out the tan tangent alpha, that's where the significance of that come, comes from, and why it's justified. I'd say almost kind of step like step like their projectiles question. So if anyone likes this and wants to look at kind of slightly more unusual, more algebraic things and have a look at some step one or step two because this is almost getting there well on that and I don't think it was done particularly well this January anyway that's it um, for this M2 video I hope you find it useful bye